Hey, does anyone know how to get my picture to show up when I'm not uh, using video? For me, it kind of just happened. I don't know why. I think you can change it like in the main um, like Zoom window where you can change your profile picture and stuff. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think even if you go into your account settings, there's an option in there to change your uh, the image. All right, all right. Let me try that. Let me see here. Yeah, I I don't think you can do it while you're in a meeting. Um, but you have to, you know, as long as you have the app installed, then you can go in and change it in the uh, main window. Okay, got it. All right, so good morning, everyone. Happy snowy Thursday. I am going to pick up where we left off on Tuesday. So let me share my screen here. Ah. Hey, Troy, you see my screen here with the Zoom app? So the settings. Uh, I see your desktop. Oh, you don't see the Zoom app window? Weird. It must hide it. it must hide it when I'm. No, I just see your desktop. Oh, OK. Anyway, but if you're in the main Zoom app in the upper right hand corner, um, there's your profile. And then in there, you can go into settings and somewhere in here there's okay. somewhere in here you can set up your image oh they're under yeah, profile work on that. So if you go into settings then under profile it's in there all right so let me get rid of that window uh -huh. let me share this All right, so picking up where we were on Tuesday uh, with GIS data, we were last talking about continuous data, which changes gradually over uh, distance. And we had talked about that image that I had up there. We talked about how one of the most common types of continuous data uh, that we use in GIS is the digital elevation model. Um, which is a type of continuous data that uses shades of gray to represent elevation. And then um, the third type of um, image data or raster data that gets used in GIS are what are known as pictures. And pictures are simply um, raster images that have been georeferenced for locational accuracy. And of course, the most common type of uh, picture that's used in GIS is an orthophoto. And that's typically used as a background for uh, maps. And an orthophoto is a special type of aerial photo that's been corrected for um, perspective distortion. Because if you think about the way in which uh, lines of perspective tend to converge, 
if you have tall buildings that can distort the apparent location of those buildings. And so ortho photos have been um, ortho, what they call ortho rectified uh, so that those buildings appear in the correct locations. Now, since uh, image data, meaning any raster data is, uh, you know, since it's raster in nature, the accuracy is directly tied to the resolution of the image file. And when we're talking about the accuracy of image data, it's expressed as a spatial resolution or cell size. And typically that's in metric, but not always. It depends on, um, it depends on who put that data together and uh, what units they're using. Oftentimes in the US it's in uh, feet, but um, many times it's in meters as well. You just need to check the metadata to understand which units are being used. So to give you an example of cell size, um, if we have a cell size of 15 centimeters, which means that each pixel represents a square on the ground that's 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, um, that's going to be about 10 times more accurate than a cell size of 15 meters, which would means that each pixel represents an area on the ground that's 15 meters by 15 meters. Right, so this is an example of an aerial orthophoto at 15 meter resolution, right? So each one of those pixels that you're seeing there is 15 meters by 15 meters. So um, what is 15 meters in feet approximately? Like 45 or more yeah. like, I guess. Somewhere, somewhere between like 45 and 50 feet, right? So. That means that each pixel there is approximately 50 feet by 50 feet on the ground. It's a huge area. And then if we compare that, the same aerial image now looking at 15 centimeter cells, meaning that uh, each of those pixels is now 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters. And um, in inches, that's going to be approximately, you know, somewhere around seven by seven inches. And so that's going to be obviously a, a much finer resolution. You can see a lot more detail in that image, right? And so when we're talking about uh, the resolution of these raster graphics in GIS, we always refer to it as either cell size or spatial resolution. Some of the image data file formats that we deal with in GIS um, are as follows. Um, IMG and OVR are native ArcGIS grid formats, although um, interestingly, you don't find them stored in that format all that often. DEM is a very common one. Again, that's short for digital elevation model. Um, that's a very common uh, type that's used by the USGS to represent uh, topography, um, particularly in the past, but it's also still used uh, pretty commonly today. SDTS, Spatial Data Transfer Standard. Um, that's the latest standard from USGS that stores both vector and raster. We discussed this file format earlier. Um, and USGS has moved over to this format specifically because of the ability to store both types of data in one file format. SID is an interesting one. Um, so SID is a, it's a company made by a company called Lizard Tech and it's called a Mr. SID file. And it's a highly compressed image format that's used for very large or very detailed images. Um, 99% of the time it's used for aerial ortho photos. And it's, uh, to me, it seems like almost a magical type of file format because you get an amazing amount of data in a very small file size. So you might download a, a Mr. Sid file that's like a one meg file, right? And then you open it up in GIS and it's like this vast area of highly detailed aerial photo. And it's kind of uh, mind boggling that they can fit that much data into one megabyte, uh, but somehow they do. So that's why that format is used typically uh, for any kind of very large or detailed images like 
uh, aerial photos. And then some of the common open source raster file formats like JPEG, TIFF, and PNG can all be used in GIS as well. It's important to note with those that um, they're not um, automatically geo-referenced. So if you're using those file formats, you need to geo-reference them in GIS to tell the software how that image lines up with the geographic data that's in your map. Um, and then finally, we have RPF, which is raster product format. It's a raster format that's used by the US Department of Defense for, for declassified uh, mapping data. So if you remember the vector format for uh, Department of Defense image, imagery is VPF, and then for raster, it's RPF. All right, so we've talked about vector data, we've talked about raster data, and then next we are going to talk about attribute data. So attribute or tabular data is descriptive in nature and provides information about the features that appear on your map. So every feature on a map has or should have attribute data associated with it that provides additional information about that feature. So in this regard, attribute data is really at the very heart of what makes GIS special and such a powerful technology and what separates it from being a purely graphic um, software is that you have this underlying data behind all of the features. So this is an example of attribute data from a uh, shape file, so that's vector data that um, shows the boundaries of all the states in the United States. And so you can see some of the information includes here. It indicates that each of the shapes is a polygon, the name of the state. Uh, it gives subregions, so what sort of region of the US that state is located in, the abbreviation of the state, and so on. Right, so all of this data that's baked into those features is what allows you to do uh, analysis in GIS and to find patterns and, um, and to see relationships that you otherwise might not be able to see just by looking at the graphics. So attribute data is key to the ability to use GIS for spatial analysis and identification of patterns um, that are not apparent from the feature geometry alone. Whoops. Um, so, for example, if you have attribute data about the trees on a site, you can determine the relative distribution of different species, um, or if you have counts of an invasive species of snakes in a various location, you can determine where, the, um, where that infestation started and where it's spreading. So it's like some of these data about um, that give you numeric data and um, other types of attribute data are what really give ArcGIS the ability to do analysis on the graphic portion of the map. So when we talk about attribute data file formats, um, in ArcGIS it's simply referred to as a table, and that can be stored in a number of different formats. So first of all, you have a DBF, that's the native ArcGIS database file. And um, that's something that you'll find as a required component of any shape file. So if you remember when we spoke about shape files earlier, a shape file is not a single file, it's actually a collection of files. And one of the files that's in that collection is a DBF. So that's the, the table or the tabular data portion of that shape file. You can also use a CSV, which is comma separated values. That's a common open source data file format. So for anybody who's worked in uh, Excel, for example, uh, working with spreadsheets, CSV is a very common file format that you find, and that can be loaded directly into ArcGIS. You can also use text files um, or TXT, which is a common open source text file format, which can be formatted to uh, indicate tabular data. XLS, or actually we can add to that XLSX, um, which are the native Microsoft Excel file formats, 
Obviously, spreadsheet data is tabular in nature. That can be added directly into GIS. And one thing I will note is that even if you have something that's strictly, uh, for example, like an Excel spreadsheet, you can bring that into um, GIS and you can use it in one of two ways. One way is if that, if you have, for example, um, information in that table that would help link it to uh, features that are already in the map, right? So let's say that you wanted to add to that, uh, that table that we we're looking at earlier that had the shapefile for the states, all the state boundaries. Let's say you were bringing in a table that had information about the population of each state. As long as you had the names of the states in that table that could line up with the names of the states in the shapefile, then you can attach that population data to the uh, shapefile so that you're attaching that population data. A second way that you can use tabular data in GIS is if you have X and Y coordinates. So latitude and longitude coordinates, you can actually use those directly in GIS to um, generate points in your, um, in your map so that you can have locations attached to that tabular data. <clears throat> and then finally, we'll talk about metadata, which is a unique but very important category of data. So when we talk about metadata, um, metadata is data that describes other data. So a primitive example of that um, might be a library's card catalog. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a card catalog or if those were completely gone by the time you're in grade school. Um, but when I was a kid and you had to look up a book at the library, they would have these long drawers of literally index cards um, that were <clears throat> categorized by subject or by author or by title. And so you could go through <clears throat> and find a subject, for example, and there'd be index cards for each of the books that the library had on that subject. And it would indicate the title of the book, the author, the year it was published, the publishing company, information like that. So it's not the book itself, but it's information about the book. So likewise in GIS, if you're working with, um, let's say some map data, the map data is the data itself. And then the metadata is the data about that map data. So metadata for an image file might contain information such as the number of pixels, the color depth, the image format, the date the file was created, um, who compiled it, how that data was collected, and so on. So it's data that helps you know about the reliability of the data that you're using. When we look at metadata in GIS, it might look something like this. So this gives us some information, uh, gives a summary of what that data is about, a description of it. Um, Sometimes you'll know some of these don't necessarily have um, all of the information filled in, but if you scroll down further in here, it would give the date that the information was compiled, um, who was responsible. So under here, under credits, the city and county of Denver Technology Services um, was responsible for putting that data together. So having this metadata can help you understand, for example, who you might need to contact if you need more information about that data, because it tells you who was responsible for, for uh, pulling that data together. Whoops. And so one of the most important parts about metadata is that it just lets you know how reliable that data is, because it'll tell you what scale oftentimes that it was drawn for. And also, uh, perhaps most importantly, the date when that data was compiled. Um, and the date is really important because obviously if you're looking at building footprints and the date when that data was compiled is 2015, that means that any buildings that were built since 2015 are not going to show up in that data. So it helps you to understand how reliable that data is and whether or not you need to go in search of updated data. So now that we've talked about all the different types of data that you can work with in GIS, we'll look at some of the sources of data, um, some of the places where we can find that data for download. 
Now, the first thing you should understand is that finding GIS data takes patience and persistence. Um, unfortunately, it's not always easy to find what you're looking for. So you need to um, kind of have a dogged attitude about um, finding that data and tracking it down. And part of the reason for that is because there's no one source for all GIS data. It's scattered literally across thousands of websites across the internet. Um, so you need to have an idea of where you can begin to look for GIS data so that you at least have, you can make an educated guess about where you might be able to find the type of data that you're looking for. Um, one thing that I've learned over the years and I always like to tell students is that you should never be timid about calling a municipal or government GIS agency um, to ask where you might be able to find certain types of data. Oftentimes they're your best resource. And um, even if they don't have that data directly available, they can point you to where you can find it. 99% um, of the time, if you call a GIS office and you say, hey, I'm looking for this kind of data, they'll say, oh yeah, we have that. Where can I email the shapefile to? So they tend to be extremely helpful. Uh, the vast majority of the time that data is free to the public to use for you know, whatever they see fit for any types of projects. So you can call these offices and request types of data and they will send it to you. So that said, it's good to understand some of the common online sources for GIS data. And we'll look at examples of a few of these. So um, the USGS has a site called the National Atlas, which has um, various types of national GIS data available. They also run a site called the National Map, which has different types of GIS data available. Um, and they also have a site called Geodata. So you can already begin to see the problem here in that the USGS, a single government agency, has three different sites you can look at for finding GIS data, and they don't all necessarily have the same types of data in them. There's also the National Geospatial Platform. Um, this is kind of an attempt to collect all of the um, GIS data from the various government agencies. But again, you know, agencies are made up of people and people don't always follow through on things that they're supposed to do. So um, not every agency is completely up to date with the types of data that they provide to the National Geospatial Platform. Um, so it's not always necessarily um, going to be the best place to look. And in that regard, oftentimes the best place to look is at the is directly at the websites for the specific federal agencies. So if you know you're dealing with federal land that's under the management of the Bureau of Land Management, then you might want to go to the BLM uh, website for GIS data. Um, or if you're working with FEMA, they have a specific website, NASA has its own website, and so on. And I'll, I'll show examples of each of these as um, once I'm done with this slide here. State agencies are also a really good resource for state level data. So uh, CDPHE is the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And um, that is a great place to find uh, information about, for example, uh, environmental contamination, um, and things of that sort, brown brownfields um, and other data like that. They also deal with public health. So <clears throat> one of the main mapping uh, or one of the main data types they've been dealing with lately is coronavirus and looking at numbers of infections and uh, the levels of infection in different counties and things of that nature. Um, Department of Local Affairs, DOLA, is another good source for GIS data. SLB is the State Land Board. Uh, there's the State Parks and Wildlife uh, Division that has GIS data. And you can find pretty much just about every state agency uh, that deals with you know, anything spatially, which is most uh, state agencies are going to have a portion of their website dedicated to serving up GIS data. So a lot of it is just knowing what agencies are most likely to be dealing with the type of data that you're interested in and looking for your data at those agencies. 
Uh, local municipalities are also a very good resource. So city, county, and state uh, will provide data that you can use in your maps. And um, there are also some global data sets like Trimble Data Marketplace, uh, a site called Diva GIS, GeoCommons. Um, these ones are not curated in the sense that they are open source places where people can just share GIS data that they've accumulated. It's generally not the best place to look if you're working on a site in the US because there are so many um, good high quality sites to download GIS data from for sites in the United States and Canada, um, pretty much anywhere in North America. Um, but sometimes when you get to certain European countries or parts of Asia or Africa where it's harder to find that GIS data, then these global data sets can be a good place to look uh, if you don't have any other leads. Uh, the CSU Geospatial Centroid um, is also a good place to look. So um, the Centroid is a GIS organization that's based at CSU that deals with all kinds of Colorado related uh, GIS projects and analysis. They have a staff there that uh, works on GIS projects. They um, were an important uh, source of assistance on my research project when I was mapping out bright fields in Colorado and looking at uh, site contamination and renewable energy. Um, but they also have a web, a portion of their website that um, deals with local GIS data for Colorado. And then finally, ArcGIS Open Data is sort of an attempt by um, Esri to have a one-stop shopping experience for finding GIS data. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of that data, again, is up to individual users to upload to that site. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, going to have everything, but it can be a good place to look. And then finally, the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. This is a great resource for any kind of environmental data. So it's a um, collection of, um, in many cases, live environmental data um, from various parts of the world. So that can also be a really good resource for data. So let's take a look at some of these specifically. So for example, um, if we go to um, the National Atlas, whoops, that's opening on my other window. So let me just, just bring that over. And for some reason, it didn't open right up. So let's search for National Atlas USGS. Are, are these all free to us, or are there some like, that we have to pay for? These are all free. Um, the vast majority of GIS data is free. Um, here's a national map. Oh, look at that. Did you see that link? It said the National Atlas program has ended. So that's actually good because it was really confusing having multiple sites. So I will take that one off the list. Um, let's go to National Map instead. Looks like they're actually starting to get their act together. So this is the national map. Um, it has a map viewer that lists all of the different types of national map data that are available from the USGS uh, that you can turn on and off and you can download directly from that viewer. Um, and then they also have direct links down here to uh, some of the data that they have available um, in the national map. There's all, actually, I'm just gonna leave that open right where it is. Um, there's also uh, USGS geodata. Right. And so this is a listing of um, kind of all the geographically referenced data that's available uh, through the USGS. And you can see there's 192,000 data sets available. So that's quite a bit 
of data. Um, so for example, you might want to search for, let's say tree cover. We'll see what it comes up with. So it's got 1100 um, that have to do with tree cover. So um, canopy height and cover in Sonoma County, California from 2013, tree canopy cover um, for the taiga tundra ecotone in, from 2000 to 2005 all kinds of different data. So then you might want to use further keywords to um, narrow that down. They also have, you can see here, West Africa coastal vulnerability mapping, deforestation from 2000 to 2012. So it's not just data about the US. Uh, a lot of this is data that has to do with other sites around the world. So that's data.gov. Um, if we're looking at various federal agencies, so let's say we're looking at FEMA, I'll click on that link. Oh, look at that. Some of these sites may have changed since last year. So let's go to Google. And you can always, of course, just search for these on Google. Google can't be found either. That's kind of weird. <laughs> Why would that be? Can you guys still hear me? Am I, is my internet still working? Okay, that's weird. Why can't I bring up Google? Let's bring up a new window here. Oh, now Google's working. All right. So let's look up on here. Um, oh, we'll do BLM GIS data. Very interesting. I do not know why I'm having this issue searching for things. FEMA GIS data. Hmm. Okay. Don't know what's going on with that. Uh, we'll come back to that. Let's see if any of these work here. Let's try state land board. Okay, this one looks like it's working. <laughs> there we go. So um, this is a connection to state land board GIS data and state the state land board for those of you who are not familiar with it is a state agency that tracks the um, ownership and uh, land use of land all across the state of Colorado. And so they have a map that will show, for example, state-owned land. Um, it shows where there are gas and oil drilling leases. It shows where there are mining leases. Uh, it shows land that's uh, privately owned versus uh, state-owned versus federally owned. Um, and in fact, they, you can see here all different kinds of layers they have. They also have information from Colorado Parks and Wildlife about um, the range of, for example, bobwhite quail um, or snow geese, winter range, mule deer. So you can get all kinds of uh, environmental data about various species in here. Um, there's county boundaries, of course, but all sorts of different um, information here um, about land ownership and management and um, other types of data within the state state land board. Let's try some of these other ones again. Let's try BLM. All right, didn't like that. Let's go directly to the Colorado site for BLM. There we go. So let's see, BLM Colorado. I'm not sure where their data is. So I am once again going to do a Google search for that. It's crazy. A lot of these sites, I just used these sites less than a year ago and they must have all changed their web addresses for some reason. So let's look at um, BLM uh, GIS data. 
Here we go. So here's GIS data. And of course, if you're working with um, land, tip per particularly in the Western US, then a lot of that land is owned by the federal government under uh, the management of the Bureau of Land Management. If you're working in like New York or Massachusetts, they own hardly any land, if any, uh, out east. But you can see out west, they have GIS data for Alaska, California, Colorado, Idaho, uh, Nevada, Oregon, and Utah. So if we go to Colorado here, They have a map viewer here. I'll just check through their little splash screen. And they have a map viewer here that has different types of data. You can see the colored boxes and polygons on here. These represent different types of data that are available. Um, and you can see those layers by clicking on this layer list up here. There are a bunch more here that are not turned on. So for example, I can turn off uh, field offices. What else is turned on in here? Surface management. And if I just wanted to look at, for example, um, let's see, recreation, right? So I can just turn on recreation and it shows all of the recreational sites um, across the state. So there are different types of data and then you can download this data to use in your own maps uh, in GIS. They also have them um, organized down at the bottom according to categories. So um, there's cadastral data. Does anyone remember what cadastral means? What type of data is cadastral? Anyone? So cadastral refers to property um, specifically property ownership and then the um, attributes of property. So it includes things like property boundaries, uh, buildings that are on property, um, any kind of um, other data relating to that property. So in this case, uh, they have a lot of data about the public land survey system because that's how, um, how property is uh, divided up basically in the Western United States. Um, and then they also have like uh, property boundaries for various types of uh, mining and uh, drilling operations. They also have energy information here, right? So oil and gas and so forth. Um, if we look at recreation, right? So there's recreation point features and recreation polygon features. And again, you'll notice they show here the different types of formats that you can download this data in. And 99% of the time, what you're looking for is the shapefile um, because the shapefile is that native format for uh, ArcGIS and that's going to be the easiest to bring in. There's also uh, vegetation. Well, it says this category includes themes such as vegetation treatments, forestry, botany, and weeds, but it doesn't show anything there. So. Um, <clears throat> I assume they have that data for other states. So that's an example of some of the federal type of data you can get. Um, you can also get FEMA obviously is the, um, the uh, emergency management, federal emergency management agency. So if you're looking for data about natural disasters or things like hurricanes or earthquakes or things of that nature, then you can find GIS data about that. Um, NASA is also actually a surprisingly good source for um, all types of data um, from around the world because obviously they have satellites um, that are tracking various parts of the Earth all the time. Give this a moment to load. And so here you can see they have 27,856 data layers available um, that you can look at, um, different types of um, visualization. So here's a world map, and then you can turn on and off different layers and download those. Um, so that can be a good search. This can actually be a good source for some worldwide data that otherwise might be hard to find. Um, usually it's environmental type data, like things like tree cover, um, or uh, different types of ecosystems or things of that nature. 
State agencies are really useful, obviously, for uh, state level data. So if we look at parks and wildlife, for example, Right, so here under Parks and Wildlife, um, they have 273 data sets available that are provided by Parks and Wildlife. Um, locations of Colorado Parks and Wildlife facilities, Colorado Parks and Wildlife crucial habitat, terrestrial habitat. Um, and not all of these are necessarily GIS data. Some of them are just standalone uh, static maps. Uh, some of them might just be data tables like spreadsheets. Um, Colorado Fishing Atlas, right? So you can see examples of all the different types of data here. Um, national recreation areas, tribal lands, trails, right? So these are all the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Managed Trails all over the state. Um, basin wide layer package, whatever that is. Some of these, again, you would have to read about, but if I click on one of these, let's find, let's see, uh, wildfires. Let's click on that. And usually the page that it clicks through to, that's your metadata, right? So here's the metadata for this particular set. So it has a description. It gives you all the information about how this data was collected, who is responsible for it, um, how it was compiled. Um, tells you the name of the layer that's included. Um, there are various keywords over on the side here, the credits. So it's credited to USGS from May of 2016. So any wildfires since May of 2016 might not be included in this data unless it's uh, since been updated. Um, there's a URL to that data. And then of course you can also um, there are options to um, download if I click on data up here, right? It shows, it'll show you the tabular uh, data that's available with that um, particular um, feature class, right? So in here you can see management name and feature category, um, different types of information. I don't necessarily know what all of these stand for. A lot of times they use these little um, abbreviations as the attribute titles. So you need to check with the specific agency to see what some of those are referring to. Um, but that's a good example of some of the state data. Um, I've actually been in, in my research project, I did a lot of work with uh, CDPHE for looking at contaminated sites and finding um, brownfields or sites that were contaminated by oil spills or things of that nature. Um, and then local municipalities are going to be one of your best sources. So these are available at the state, city and county level. And um, I'll just show you examples here. So obviously at the state level, we have um, the state of Colorado. We'll let this open up. And it didn't like that for some reason. All right, that's weird. So let's, we are going to look this up on Google. Here we go. So. Um, this is some of the Colorado GIS data that's available. Um, so obviously they have things like municipal boundaries, counties, hospital districts, school districts, library districts, um, information from the Division of Water Resources, information from Parks and Wildlife, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So there's all sorts of data that's drawn up at the state level that's available here that can be useful for uh, various types of projects that you may be working on. And one thing I will caution about is that you need to always pay attention to what level of um, bureaucracy that agency is operating at. So if you are looking for information about Fort Collins tree cover, or let's say Denver tree cover, 
I would look first at Denver's GIS data, not at state of Colorado GIS data, because the, the data at the state level is not going to be nearly as accurate as the data at, this, at the city level. So you, you typically want to look at the most local level first and then work your way out if you can't find the data that you need. So if I go back in here, let's say we're looking at uh, the county level. So this particular one is for Arapahoe County. And this gives you access to download data for Arapahoe County. I can go in here to where it says download GIS data. I agree. Right, and here they have a list of the layer names, right? So you have the different types of layers of information that you can download for Arapahoe County. They have lakes and libraries and parcels and railroads and rivers and soils and trails and zip codes, all sorts of different information. The file type, um, right? So they have uh, geodatabases, DWG files, shape files. What format would you probably want to download this data as? Shape file. Shape file, yes. That's always, that's typically the one that you're looking for. Um, and then you also have different types of projections. We'll talk about projections in just a minute. Um, but projections are um, the way in which that um, map data is uh, recreated on a um, flat two dimensional surface, right? Because we're talking about the surface of the earth, which is curved, and then you have different projections. And we'll talk about those in. Uh, just a minute. <clears throat> and then you also have, of course, uh, the local city level data. So if I go to city, amazing, the number of pages that have changed their links just in the past year. Spell. All right, so this is the Denver um, Open Data Catalog. So this is um, their GIS uh, data and you can search through here or you can, uh, there's a link here to view all data sets and you'll see the number of data sets that the city of Denver has 265 data sets available. Right, and again, they're going to list them here. It's uh, it lists you know a few per page here. Um, so let's try see what's on page five here. Libraries. So if you wanted to see all of the public libraries within city and county of Denver, I can click on that, um, and then it shows some basic uh, metadata here. So it shows that the author is Denver, Denver Public Library. Uh, the maintainer is the technology services for city and county of Denver. Um, this is an address you can email if you have questions about that data. And then different formats that you can download that data in, right? So again, the shape file right up there top and you can download that. And libraries um, are going to be a set of point data. They'll just be points indicating the locations of the libraries, but you can also download various types of uh, line data or polygon data, depending on the type of data uh, that you're searching for. So for example, if I was looking for uh, tree cover and data, I can search for it. Here's tree canopy assessment um, for different years. So for example, I could um, look at tree canopy assessment for 2013 and uh, download that data and maybe they might even have individual trees. Let's try tree. So there's just tree canopy that you can download for 2014 is the latest year they have it for, but it'll give you um, a polygon uh, data layer of all of the tree canopy for the city of Denver. Right, so that's local municipalities. And then you have uh, those global data sets. I'm gonna skip over those because they're very hit or miss and not particularly useful for you sites in the United States or um, elsewhere in North America. Um, the geospatial centroid, 
And actually, I know for sure that they changed their site. So I'll just go directly to Google. I don't know why all these places decided to change their web addresses. There we go. So if we go to the CSU Geospatial Centroid. So here they have, they maintain various blogs and information and news about what they specifically are doing. Um, some of the types of projects they're working on, you can look at projects like current projects that they're working on up here. And Brightfields, that's, that's my project um, that I was working on with them uh, throughout most of 2020, but with some of their other projects here. Um, but under resources, they have a link to data And then here they have links out to various um, data about um, mostly about Colorado and where you can find different data sets. Um, if you go to the Colorado data catalog here, um, this just links out to that uh, state level, the Colorado information marketplace, right? So this has data sets that uh, cover the entire state. So the centroid can also be a good uh, starting place to find uh, various resources related to the state of Colorado. Um, ArcGIS Open Data is, again, that's a worldwide resource. It's up to various people to upload information to it. So obviously more populated places tend to have more data available on that site. Um, but sometimes you get lucky and you find things on there that you can't find elsewhere. So for example, let's say we're searching for Colorado wildlife. Um, you can see that they actually have information here. There's Colorado wildlife movement data, um, wildlife habitats, and so forth. So there's all kinds of um, wild turkey overall range. So you can get different kinds of data here uh, based on Colorado wildlife. And then finally, the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. So that's, again, environmental data uh, that you can download. And the, the great thing about the ArcGIS Living Atlas is that a lot of it is updated in close to real time. So that means that that data is, um, tends to be extremely up to date. And so you can search this for like, let's try tree cover and we'll see what comes up here. Right, so they have uh, tree canopy cover from uh, the National Land Cover Database. Uh, National Land Cover Database, by the way, is a great resource. Um, over here, they have National Land Cover Database land cover. Um, that's a great resource when you're working on projects for landscape ecology because it's all data about um, basically, you know, what we're look the types of things that we're looking at in. Um, GIS and or in uh, landscape ecology, so it'll it'll talk about different types of ecosystems or tree cover or areas that are uh, developed versus areas that are forest or grassland or different uh, types of environmental cover of that sort. Um, there are also world land cover databases that you can use to look at other parts of the world. Um, here's Chesapeake Bay watershed land cover. There's all different types of uh, data that you can get. And um, it's a really great resource when you're specifically looking for environmental data. So that's the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. So let's minimize that. Um, now, even knowing about all these websites, you can't always find the data that you're looking for. And so it's good to know some basic search keywords that can be helpful uh, when you're looking for GIS data on the web. And so some of the good ways of searching for GIS data, including um, you'd replace the words data type with obviously the type of data you're looking for. Um, so if you're looking for, um, let's say, roads in Fort Collins, you could type in Fort Collins roads geospatial data or Fort Collins roads GIS download or Fort Collins roads shapefile. Um, 
or if you're looking for data about specific municipality or agency, um, open data is the terminology that's been in uh, wide use in the last um, it really took off about five years ago, and most agencies or municipalities now refer to their GIS data portals as open data. Um, so you can search for anything followed by the words open data to see what kind of data is available. So if I was looking for, um, let's say I was working in city of Miami, or in, let's not do Miami, let's do somewhere else. Let's say Boston, right? So I can type Boston open data and Boston maps open data site. And so this gives me links. So open data again, it's all about geo GIS data. So it says find geospatial data. You can type in search terms here, um, or you can explore, you know, like specific types of data that they have highlighted here. Let's see if they have tree cover. So they have trees. So they have actually, so trees digitized citywide from plan metric project completed in 2011. Trees were captured within city public ways and properties. Right, and again, for each of these, when you click on it, before you download that data, you wanna generally read through. That metadata says this was last updated December 7th, 2020. So even though the tree data was collected in 2011, it was updated in December, 2020. So that's some pretty recent data that's available for the locations of trees. I don't know, there we go, now it's clicking through. Right, and again, you can go up here to download. It has different formats available. And I will ask Emma, what format would I wanna download my data in? I missed that. A shape file? Shape file, yes, that's the correct answer. So whenever there's a shapefile available, that's typically what you want to go for. All right, uh, let's go back to, whoops, where'd my presentation go? All right. Okay, so now I'd like to go through a quick uh, overview of ArcGIS Pro, and then we'll talk uh, quickly about map projections since um, that's something that comes up a lot when you're downloading uh, GIS data. So this is what you see when you open up um, ArcGIS and you start a new project. And um, to give you an orientation to the various parts of the screen, First, we'll start with the upper left here. You have some quick access tools. These are just things like open and save and undo. Below that, you have your ribbon tabs. So each one of those opens up a tab of tools, uh, of uh, what's known as a tool ribbon underneath it. And this is the same sort of um, uh, format that's used in like Microsoft Word or a lot of other um, Windows-based programs where you have tabs along the top and then each tab has various tools associated with it. And you'll notice that some of these tools have these gray lines that separate them. And that is just a way of identifying groups of tools that are related to each other. Over on the left, you have the contents pane. That is a listing of all of the layers in the current map. Then you have project tabs. You can have multiple maps open at once and the tabs for those maps will show up along the top there. Um, by default, it just calls it map if it doesn't have another name. Then you have the view pane in the center and that is the, um, the actual map itself where you can visualize all of your geospatial data that you're working with. On the right side is the catalog pane. 
And the catalog pane is a way of browsing for, you can browse through your databases for uh, data that you're working with in the current project. You can browse through various folders to find uh, data that you may have downloaded from online. Down at the lower left, it shows the map scale. So in this case, it's showing that the current map scale is one to 29,400, uh, sorry, one to 29,485,617. And you'll notice it's not saying one inch equals 100 feet. It's, in, it's a ratio. So who here knows how a map ratio works in terms of scale? What is that ratio telling us? It's one, one unit on the map equals however many units uh, on the ground. So if it's Correct. like one, so if it's like 100,000, then it'd be 100,000 units, whatever unit you're using. Exactly. And it doesn't matter what unit you're using, right? Because it means that, <clears throat> because the units are the same on both sides. So one to a thousand would mean that one inch on the map equals a thousand inches in the real world, or one foot on the map equals 1,000 feet in the real world. Um, so since it's the same units on both sides, you don't need to specify units. It's just a ratio of one unit on the map to however many units in the real world. And then just to the right of that, you have the coordinates, uh, coordinate display for the current location of the cursor. Um, in this case, it's showing degrees west and degrees north because we're looking at North America. Right, so over on the left side is the contents pane, which is one of the most um, important parts of the screen, because that's where you deal with all of the layers uh, that you're working with for the current map. Um, some of this we're probably not going to go over today, but we'll go over it um, next time when we're looking at uh, actually working in GIS. Um, but basically it displays the order of the map layers in the same order that they show up on the map. So layers that are near the top of the list are going to show up on top of uh, or covering over top of layers that are further down on the list. It's very much like Photoshop uh, or Illustrator for those of you um, <clears throat> who've used that software. So layers on top are going to um, cover over top of layers or lower down. And a lot of the critical display and informational data for each map layer is controlled primarily through that contents pane. Um, and <clears throat> we'll look at that in um, a little more detail again uh, next Monday when we start using GIS. Um, but if you have lots of layers, you can search for layers in there. There are layer view tabs that you don't really have to worry about for the uh, ways in which we'll be using GIS. Uh, the name of the map, again, it just defaults to being called map if you haven't given it a name. And then you have the layer name. So in this case, street lights. <clears throat> Underneath, it'll indicate a little um, layer symbol so that you know, it's kind of like a key so that you know when you're looking at your map, what symbols represent what types of data. Um, so this one is a type of point data. This one is a type of polygon data. So in this example of the buildings are lavender with a gray outline, <clears throat> all of the street lights are kind of a bluish dot. You also have these check boxes that indicate the visibility of that layer, whether that layer is turned on or off so that you can see it in the map. And then you can also expand or collapse any of these views using the little triangles uh, next to each of the um, the layer names or the name of the map. And then, let's see, actually here, I wanna, I'm just gonna jump ahead here to map projections real quick, cause it makes more sense to cover that. Um, sorry, let me just put these where I want them. All right. Uh, 
Okay, so just a, <clears throat> a quick overview of uh, map projections and coordinate systems to wrap up um, our discussion of uh, sort of the overview of GIS today. So first of all, what is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink. All right, so what, <clears throat> what is a map projection? Does anyone wanna take a stab at what a map projection is? Anyone? Annie? Uh, it's the way that they've projected the uh, globe on a 2D surface. Correct. So map is a projection is a map projection is any method of flattening a surface that is curved <clears throat> in all three spatial dimensions into a plane. Right. So in other words, it's the conversion of the Earth's elliptical curvature. And I say elliptical because the Earth is not um, perfect sphere. It's more of a bulging sphere. Um, did we talk about this, the shape of the Earth and geodesy at all? I'm not sure that we actually talked about that, but does anyone know why the Earth isn't just a sphere? Why is it a bulging elliptical sphere? The tides. <laughs> the tides are related to it, but they're not the cause. Tectonic plates, something like that? Uh, actually, it's not tectonic plates, although that's a different aspect of the shape of the Earth. Alonso, you want to take a stab at it? Why might the Earth not be a perfect sphere, but instead be a sort of an elliptical fattened sphere? Uh, I'm not sure. I was going to say gravitational pull, but I'm not sure. That has something to do with it? So actually the reason that it's not a perfect sphere is because of the fact that um, it rotates on its axis, right? So people like to think about the earth as being like a solid rock, but it's not. It's actually more like a marshmallow that you've been holding over a campfire where it's got kind of a hard crusty exterior and the interior is liquid. And so if you spin that quickly around a one axis, it's going to centrifugal force means that the axis that's perpendicular to the axis of rotation is going to tend to want to go outwards. And so what part of the earth do you think is fat? Is the fattest part of the earth based on that description? Right at the uh, equator? The equator, exactly. Because that's the axis that's perpendicular to the polar axis. And so the equatorial axis is wider, is longer than the polar axis. And believe it or not, the equatorial axis is five miles wider than the polar axis, meaning that the Earth around the equator is bulging five miles um, beyond what the polar axis is, but just based on the rotational um, centrifugal force of the Earth. So anyway, a uh, map projection is a conversion of the Earth's elliptical curvature into a flat two-dimensional map. So if you think about like you're peeling an orange, uh, there are lots of different ways that you can peel that orange and kind of try to lay those curved uh, peels onto a flat surface so that you can represent it in two dimensions, right? And this can be done in almost an infinite number of ways. Uh, but all projections have one thing in common. When you project a sphere onto a flat surface, it's A, a messy process, um, and B, it's always introducing some form of distortion into the geography. So whether it's distances or areas or directions or relationships, uh, there are often several types of distortion uh, in any map that you're looking at. So there are three basic classes of map projections and they're classed based on how those projections are constructed. So you have cylindrical projections, which means that you basically wrap a piece of paper around the equator and then project all of the points on the surface of the earth straight out onto that piece of paper. You have conical projections in which you wrap a piece of paper in a cone shaped around a specific central point of interest and then project the points that way. 
or you have azimuthal where you just take a flat piece of paper and you project all of the points uh, straight up onto that piece of paper. Map projections can also be classified based on the properties that they try to preserve. So if you have an equivalency um, projection, that means that the areas, land masses, for example, the areas of land masses are proportional to one another. Conformality means that the correct shapes of land masses are preserved. Equidistance means that distances are correct. Azimuthality means that directions are accurate or true. And most commonly you have some type of a compromise, which means that you're attempting to strike a balance um, and that no properties are absolutely preserved, but they're preserved enough so that you can get relatively accurate uh, distances or directions or uh, landmass shapes and areas. So the one that uh, most people are most familiar with is the Mercator projection. And that's a cylindrical projection type that dates to 1569 and it preserves direction, right? And this is what um, the Mercator uh, projection looks like. So um, the most important thing about this is that it preserves direction and it is most accurate at the equator and gets less accurate as you move away from the equator. Um, why was this, thinking about the year when this was created, 1569, why was direction so important? What do you think they were using this map projection for that made direction so important? Maybe navigation. Exactly, navigation, specifically ocean navigation. So you wanted to make sure that if you were heading for a landmass that you knew was northwest, um, that you would be heading in the right direction in your ship as you traveled across the sea. Um, but because of the way that's projected, the land masses at the poles are wildly distorted. Um, and as you get further from the equator, you get greater and greater distortion in the land masses. So Antarctica looks way more massive than it actually is. Um, Greenland and other areas of land near the North Pole are way more, are exaggerated to be way larger than they actually are. Um, to give you an example, uh, Greenland and Africa appear to be about the same size on this map, but in actuality, Greenland is 1 14th the land area of Africa, meaning you can fit 14 Greenlands inside of Africa, but because of that polar distortion, it looks like they're about the same size. Um, but again, because this map was used for uh, ocean navigation, they didn't particularly care about whether the land masses were accurate in size. They just wanted to make sure that if they were traveling in a certain direction that they would hit the land mass that they were targeting. Another common one is the Gall-Peters projection. So this one is a variation on the Mercator projection that attempts to more accurately portray scale. So in this case, you can see that they've compressed the latitudes closer to the poles as a way of um, showing the true land mass sizes, even though the shapes are distorted, the sizes are correct. So now you can see sort of the correct size of Greenland proportional to Africa. And then probably the most commonly used one these days is what's known as the Robinson projection. This is a compromise between true scale and true shape for aesthetic purposes. So it does some compression of the polar regions, but doesn't completely compress them. Because if you think about it, every one of these uh, lines of longitude up here, these all meet at the same point on the globe, um, but they have to stretch them out in order to show the land masses, but they're compressed a little bit on the map to at least have, show at least that, you know, Greenland is somewhat smaller than Africa, but not as small as it would be if you're seeing true landmass proportions. This is the one that was adopted by the National Geographic Society and many other organizations. This is the typical map that you see hanging on classroom walls and uh, K through 12 classrooms all over the place. There's also sinusoidal projections which show true uh, land mass areas because you have all those lines of longitude coming to an actual point. 
at the top and bottom, but of course it distorts things like directions and it distorts um, the shape of the land masses. Um, but again, each of these, in each of these maps, the one thing you will notice is that the closer you are to the center of the map, the more accurate it is. And as you get further to the edges, the less accurate it is. There's also the azimuthal equidistant projection. Um, these are useful for projections centered on a specific points, such as the poles. Does anyone recognize this particular um, projection? It's used as the um, logo for a particular international organization. Anyone recognize it? Yeah, one? I was going to say it looks familiar. Yeah. Oh, shice. Yeah, it's the United Nations logo. And they, they intentionally chose a projection that didn't have any one nation at the center um, of that map so that it kind of was projecting all land masses from a more or less, um, uh, I guess you could say, independent um, point of view of the North Pole. Um, because they, the idea is that, you know, no one country is more important than the others. And then there are also a multitude of interrupted map projections that look like this, where they try to take those slices of the orange peel and um, just allow there to be gaps in between, even though, you know, this point and this point are touching on the globe, they're kind of unwrapping them uh, for the purposes of maintaining the size and scale and direction of uh, land masses. So when we talk about projections in GIS, you need to think about what projection you're using because they're all having some kind of compromise and they're um, introducing distortion, right? So this is an example of looking at the United States using three different projections. Um, so you have Mercator, Lambert, Conformal Conic, Unprojected Latitude and Longitude, and again, the center is going to be accurate, right? Kansas looks about the same for all of them. But if you're out here looking at Maine, like the Lambert conformal conic location of Maine isn't even touching the Mercator location of Maine. So depending on where your map is centered and what you're using it for, uh, it's important to pay attention to those map projections. And so coordinate system is just a map projection centered on a specific place. This is the last slide that we'll look at. Um, this is an example of a very common um, map projection system used in the United States that's known as the state plane coordinate system or the SPCS. And it breaks up every state into one or more um, projections where, where you're using a specific um, uh, map projection that's centered on a portion of that state. So you can see Colorado is broken up into Colorado North, Colorado Central, and Colorado South. So if you're looking at a map of Fort Collins, you'd want to use Colorado North. If you're looking at Denver, you want Colorado Central. If you're looking at Pueblo, you would want Colorado South. Because again, the as we talked about earlier, the center point of any map projection is going to be the most accurate point on that map. And as you get further to the edges, it gets less and less accurate. So that's why they've divided up the US into all kinds of different state plane coordinate systems. California has six of them. Alaska has one, two, well, it looks like uh, 10 of them. Uh, or maybe not quite 10, maybe nine in Alaska. Oh no, there's 10 of them. Um, so again, because you know, as, as you move along uh, geographically, you want that center point to be moving with you so that you're maintaining accuracy. Um, and this makes a big difference when you're measuring areas or measuring lengths. They will not be accurate if you're using the incorrect coordinate system. Um, so we'll talk about this more. Um, oh, there's my text at the top. Um, so again, proximity to the datum or center point means greater accuracy. And that's why there are so many different coordinate systems centered on different parts of the Earth. All right. So um, we are going to cut it off there since I went over by a few minutes. Yes, question. I got a quick question. So what if there's like a city um, that you need to get some GIS data that's split between two coordinate systems? Um, so typically there are other ways, there are other types of coordinate systems that you can use if they're split. But typically if it's like 
right on the boundary, the, the level of accuracy, like these are pretty fine scale um, coordinate systems. So if you're right on the boundary, it's not going to make a huge difference okay. in terms of accuracy. And typically you just pick the coordinate system that contains the greatest amount of that land area. All right, cool. Yep. Any other questions? All right, so again, just a reminder, next Thursday is exam number one. That'll include everything we've covered up to that point, including this uh, GIS information that we've been talking about. So I'd recommend you begin reviewing those lectures and videos that are uh, posted on Canvas so that you can get ready for that exam. And otherwise, have a good weekend. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. See you guys. Thanks, Scott.